What do snapdragons, human height, and speckled chickens have in common? Well, they are easily identified as non-Mendelian traits. By non-Mendelian, we mean that genetically, they are rule breakers. They don't follow the regular Mendelian rule that having a dominant allele means the dominant trait will show. Remember in our guinea pig video, having a dominant allele represented by a capital H meant that the guinea pig would have hair? Only if there was no dominant present, a genotype of little h, little h, would there be a hairless guinea pig. Well, that's a Mendelian trait, but what we're going to cover now is when these traits are non-Mendelian and they don't follow these basic rules. So let's first start by snapdragons. We confess that when we heard this word, we thought they were some really amazing kind of creature. Well, they are amazing, but they're flowers. So I don't know, that's not exactly what we envisioned. Well, in snapdragon genetics, there can be three phenotypes, red, white, or something in between, pink. It's called incomplete dominance. In incomplete dominance, the dominant allele is not completely expressed when the recessive allele is around. There isn't really a clear dominant allele. If you cross a red flower, and we're gonna write it here, big R, big R, and a white flower, little r, little r, you are going to get offspring that are big R, little r. But unlike a Mendelian trait, if this is incomplete dominance, that big R allele is not completely expressed when the little r is around. So big R, little r in this case is pink. If you cross two pink flowers, big R, little r, like shown in this Punnett square here, you can get offspring that are red, white, or pink. Incomplete dominance is different from co-dominance. Co-dominance, like a co-worker, that prefix co should make you think together. They work together, the alleles, that is. For that reason, we like to use different letters entirely to represent the alleles. There is a co-dominance involving color in some types of chickens. Take a look at this Punnett square. If you cross a black chicken, represented here by BB, and a white chicken, represented here by WW, all the offspring here are BW. BW chickens are both black and white. They're speckled. See, both traits show up. This is the essence of co-dominance. The real concept is that in incomplete dominance, one allele is not completely dominant over the other. So you see this almost in-between phenotype. In co-dominance, both alleles are expressed. It's the application that matters here. Height is fascinating. In our immediate family, Pinky is taller than Petunia. Our mom is also taller than Petunia. So how does that happen? There isn't just one height gene. There's a lot of genes that determine your height. What I mean by that is that you don't just have a pair of alleles, like big A, big A, that will code for your height. It's more like someone having a genotype of big A, big A, big B, little b, big C, little c, and maybe more genes to ultimately determine your height. And you inherit one allele for each of the height genes from each parent. All of these genes work together to determine your height. Your skin color is also determined by many genes, just like your height. These are called polygenic traits. Poly means many, so many genes coding for one trait is what polygenic means. There's a lot of phenotypes that are easy to tell. Your eye color, your hair texture, your height, whether you have a straight thumb or hitchhiker thumb. But one phenotype that you can't tell just by looking is your blood type. Your blood is really made up of many things, platelets, plasma, red blood cells. But you've probably heard before that when blood is donated, it's very important that it is matched correctly. And that's true because blood type phenotypes vary. It really boils down to the fact that red blood cells, they're not naked. They have proteins on their surface. And it turns out that your immune system is very protective and if it gets blood that's donated that has different proteins that it's not used to, it will attack them. With blood type, you can have several different phenotypes, A, B, AB, or O. These letters stand for antigens that are found on the red blood cells. So type A blood, for example, has A antigens on the surface of red blood cells. Type B blood, for example, has B antigens on the surface of red blood cells. 
Type AB has both A and B antigens on the surface of red blood cells. Type O, I like to think of it looking like a zero. It doesn't have A or B antigens. It's naked. Well, okay, it does have other proteins on its surface, but not A or B. So think of O as looking like a zero. It doesn't have A or B. So if you have type B blood, you have B antigens on the surface of red blood cells. That means a person with type B can accept another person's type B blood because B is an antigen that their body recognizes. But if you try to give that person a type A blood type, that's an antigen that the immune system does not recognize. That person's immune system would attack. It would also attack AB blood because that includes the A that it doesn't recognize. Now type O would be safe. Remember O? Think of like a zero. It doesn't have A or B antigens, so type O can donate to everyone. Now, while O individuals can donate to everyone, they can only receive blood from another type O because type O doesn't have A or B antigens, so their immune system will attack any other blood type that does. Neither of us have type AB blood, but we would think this is a cool blood type to have in the sense that you could receive blood from anyone. If an AB person received blood from a person that had type A, well, they've got the A, so it's all good. And if an AB person received blood from a person that had type B, well, they've got the B antigen too, so it's all good. They can receive blood from type O too because there's not any antigens to even worry about. The phenotype of type A blood is A. But the genotype is written like this or this. The format of writing here helps with multiple alleles like blood type problems. And we can show you why when we work this out in the Punnett square. Now you may notice that I said that blood type A could be written this way or this way. Without testing, we don't really know which one it is. You can consider this one to be homozygous and this one to be heterozygous. The phenotype of type B blood is B, but the genotype is written as this or this. The phenotype of type AB blood is AB, and the genotype is written this way. There's no other way to write that one. The phenotype for type O blood is O, and the genotype is written like this. Remember how I said that the O kind of looks like a zero, and so you can think of it as having zero blood type antigens? Well, that's what it is. Little I, little I, no coefficient. Would you like to know one of the most underappreciated pieces of cytoplasm out there? Platelets. We take for granted the function of our platelets, which are fragments of cytoplasm that help stop us from bleeding. They help our blood clot when we get hurt. But there is a disorder called hemophilia that can affect those platelets because special clotting factor proteins that are needed to work with the platelets may not work correctly. So even a basic cut could be dangerous for people with hemophilia because they could bleed continuously. We have many treatments for the symptoms of hemophilia, and this has greatly improved outcomes with this disorder, although it wasn't always that way. Hemophilia is a sex-linked recessive trait, which means it's different from the basic Mendelian genetic problems. What do I mean by that? Well, we still use the terms dominant and recessive for alleles, but this time, because it's sex-linked, the alleles are on sex chromosomes. This is the case with sex-linked traits. So what is a sex chromosome? Well, recall that humans have 46 chromosomes, Chromosomes are made up of DNA and protein, and they contain your genes. Well, two of your 46 chromosomes, they are called the sex chromosomes. In a karyotype, it is usually the last two chromosomes that are the sex chromosomes. The sex chromosomes are called X and Y chromosomes, but it has nothing to do with the shape of the chromosome. That's always kind of confusing, but please don't think that Y chromosomes are shaped like a Y and X chromosomes are shaped like an X. This used to always confuse me. It has nothing to do with their name. The reason they got their name is actually kind of interesting. So to the Google for that. Everyone has an X chromosome, but if you have another X chromosome, meaning you have two X chromosomes, you are female. And if you have a Y chromosome, meaning you have an X and a Y chromosome, 
you are male. There are also genetic disorders where you can have extra copies of sex chromosomes, but we will not go into that in this clip. Sex-linked traits are traits that are specifically on the sex chromosomes. Most sex-linked traits tend to be on the X chromosome because it is larger than the Y chromosome and it contains more genes than the Y chromosome. The disorder hemophilia is like this. Now we will use the letter capital H to represent an allele for having normal blood clotting function and a letter lowercase h to represent an allele for having hemophilia. Hemophilia is a sex-linked recessive disorder, which is why it's being represented by a lowercase letter h. Only it must be placed on the sex chromosome as a superscript, like an exponent. A woman that does not have hemophilia could have the genotype X big H, X big H, or X big H, X little h. Because as long as she's got at least one dominant allele, that dominating allele will be what shows. So no hemophilia, since again, hemophilia is a recessive sex-linked disorder. The only way for her to have hemophilia would be the genotype X little h, X little h, because only when there is no dominant present will that recessive show up, at least in this type of trait. Now for a male to not have hemophilia, his genotype would have to be X big H, Y. Notice how I did not put anything on the Y chromosome. Again, most sex-linked traits are on the X chromosome. If he has the genotype X little h, Y, then he has hemophilia. He doesn't have two X chromosomes, so he cannot be a carrier. So let's say that two people that do not have hemophilia have children. However, let's say that the woman is a carrier that means she is heterozygous. How do you do a sex-linked Punnett square cross for this kind of trait? Step one, identify the genotypes of the parents. So the mother was a carrier. She is X big H, X little h. She does not have hemophilia because of that dominant allele present, but she is a carrier. The male, if he does not have hemophilia, well, he must be X big H, Y. There's no other option for him. Step two, place one parent on the top outside of the square like this and place the other parent on the left outside of the square like this. Step three, cross them. For formatting purposes, place X chromosomes before Y and you also write any sex chromosomes with dominant letters first. The results you get in the squares would be the offspring, the babies. The genotype ratio could be written out like this. The phenotype ratio, remember that these are the observable traits, can be written out that there is a 75% chance that the child will be born without hemophilia and a 25% chance that a child would have hemophilia for this boy here. You could also make this a ratio, so three to one. Notice that in this type of example of a sex-linked recessive disorder, males are more likely to inherit this disorder because there is only one X chromosome present. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious.